everybody, Rachel here. Today I'm asking the question, how do we know what causes a disease? It's pretty important. We often need to know what causes a disease before we can cure it, or even better, prevent it from happening in the first place. So how do we know what causes a particular disease? Say, malaria or Tay-Sachs, or lung cancer. Nowadays, everyone knows what causes many diseases, but how did we get to that point? How do you know that the influenza virus causes the flu? Well, a lot of people did a lot of work, of course, but I'm talking about the philosophy of it. How do you prove that one thing causes another thing? That is a question that has plagued doctors and scientists for centuries, leading to many famous and pretty nasty disputes over it. Think of Jon Snow. No, not that one. That one. He stopped a cholera epidemic by preventing a water pump from working. But even after that, many experts at the time still believed in the miasma theory of disease. Or Ignaz Semmelweis, figuring out that to prevent many cases of peripheral fever, just have doctors wash their hands. He wasn't believed either. Of course, one reason why many innovative concepts are not believed is often stubborn pig-headedness. But really, how do you decide who's right? In the late 19th century, Robert Koch and Friedrich Loeffler attempted to formulate a way to do just that. Known as Koch's postulates, they're designed to establish a causative relationship between a microbe and a disease. Now right there, you're already seeing a problem with this. Not all diseases are caused by microbes. But in the late 19th century, especially in Germany, it was the heyday of microbe discovery. So that's what was on their minds. Viruses hadn't been discovered yet. And of course, no one knew anything about DNA. Koch's postulates are, one, the microorganism must be found in abundance in diseased organisms, but not in healthy organisms. Two, the microorganism must be isolated from a diseased organism and grown in pure culture meaning it must be able to be grown in the lab. Three, the cultured microorganism must cause disease when introduced into a healthy organism. And four, the microorganism must be re-isolated from the new diseased experimental host and identified as identical to the original specific causative agent. Wow, that takes me back to school. You can definitely see problems with these, especially ethical ones. But even setting those aside, not every healthy organism won't have your microorganism. In some diseases, asymptotic carriers, people who have the disease but don't show any symptoms, are more common than those who are actually sick. The problem with needing a disease-causing agent to be grown in the lab jumps out too. Viruses can't be grown in pure culture, for one. And not every person who is exposed to your disease-causing agent will even acquire the infection due to differences in immune responses, whether that's just normal healthy immune functioning, acquired immunity, such as a baby through her mother's breast milk, or even genetic immunity. Even Koch realized that his postulates weren't the final answer. He applied them successfully to identify the causative agents in cholera and tuberculosis, but as soon as you get to typhoid, these were three of the big scourges of 19th century cities, you get the infamous typhoid Mary, an asymptotic carrier. But even with the problems, Koch's postulates have been successfully generalized to many different diseases. The real problem is using them alone or extrapolating them out too far. They were still in common use up through the 1950s, and enough epidemiologists still swore by them in the 1980s that they were used as apologetics for HIV AIDS denialism. And that's despite the fact that we already had something better. In 1965, Sir Austin Bradford Hill, an epidemiologist and statistician, developed new criteria to try to provide epidemiological evidence of a causal relationship between a presumed cause and an observed effect. So right there, we're not just talking about microbes or even just diseases. The Bradford Hill criteria can be applied to interventions too. Sir Austin Bradford Hill, by the way, also pioneered the randomized clinical trial and ran a huge prospective cohort study in the UK, and you know how much I love those, that linked smoking and lung cancer. 
just in case you needed to learn about somebody inspiring today. The Bradford Hill criteria are more complicated than Koch's postulates, indicating everything that epidemiologists had learned in the intervening time. They are, one, strength of association or effect size. A causal relationship is more likely the larger the association is. Two, consistency or reproducibility. A causal relationship is more likely if you have consistent findings over different populations at different sites and with different samples. That's key. Three, specificity. A causal relationship is more likely if you have a very specific population at a specific site and with no other likely explanations. Four, temporality. The effect must follow the cause. That seems basic, but it's important to keep in mind. Also, if you're expecting a delay between the cause and the effect, the effect has to happen after that delay. You don't get to claim that gummy bears cause a cold if you eat a gummy bear and immediately start sneezing. We know that the incubation period for a cold is longer than that. Five, biological gradient, also known as the dose response effect. A greater prevalence of the cause should lead to a greater incidence of the effect. But not always, sometimes the mere presence of a factor can trigger the effect. Six, plausibility. The relationship between the cause and the effect should be scientifically plausible. Now, sometimes the current state of science isn't up to explaining the mechanism between cause and effect yet, but scientists are usually pretty good at knowing what's plausible and what isn't. Seven, coherence. This one's talking about coherence between laboratory findings and epidemiological findings. If you have coherence between them, it's more likely a causal relationship. But a lack of laboratory findings can't nullify solid epidemiological findings. Sometimes that's enough. Eight, experiment. Sometimes you're lucky enough to have actual experimental data. But since we're talking about people for both ethical and practical reasons, that doesn't happen very often. Nine, analogy. Sometimes you have, can use an analogy or a similarity between your proposed association and another association. For instance, if you already know that cigarettes cause mutations in oncogenes that can then lead to lung cancer, and you have another factor that you think also leads to lung cancer, the oncogene mutation mechanism is the similarity. And 10, reversibility. This one wasn't originally in the Bradford Hill criteria, but it is often included nowadays. If the cause goes away, the effect should go away. Again, this isn't always true. People still have lung cancer, even if they've stopped smoking. The cancer doesn't just go away. The Bradford Hill criteria have been used to investigate many relationships between causes that aren't just microbes and their subsequent effects. For instance, the relationship between vitamin D levels during pregnancy and neonatal outcomes. Also, the relationship between sugar-sweetened beverage consumption and obesity and obesity-related diseases. So they're much more useful than Koch's postulates. But even so, 1965 was a long time ago in scientific terms, so they are somewhat outdated. Disease progression as a heterogeneous process, one that differs from person to person, is increasingly being recognized. I could get influenza and my sister could get influenza, but the manifestation and progression of the disease could be different between the two of us. Now, epidemiology is concerned with the incidence of diseases across populations, not the causes of an individual's disease. But still, disease heterogeneity complicates things a bit. Could you believe I've gotten this far without saying correlation does not equal causation? It's only the most famous saying in epidemiology, and you always, always have to keep it in mind. It's so tempting when you have a factor that you think is causing a disease because you can see the factor and you can see the disease, but correlation does not equal causation. Koch's postulates and the Bradford Hill criteria are attempts to make sure that you don't fall into that trap. There are also newer statistical methods, such as structural equation modeling and the Rubin causal model, 
that are used to try to deal with the fundamental problem of causal inference. You can never actually see both possible outcomes of applying a factor, so you're only ever able to infer causation. Causal inference as a study attempts to analyze the response of an effect variable when the cause has changed. The statistics are applied to the study, or hopefully many, many studies, that you have looking at your factor and the effect you're studying. The better your study or studies, the more likely you'll be able to infer causation. We'll be looking at different types of studies and how to tell whether a study is good or not in other videos, but we probably won't be getting too deeply into statistics because it's kind of difficult in this format and also because I've forgotten most of the complicated stuff. Sorry, Dr. Stacy, But I hope that this has given you an idea of how difficult and complicated figuring out what causes a particular disease can be. Not always, sometimes it's easy, and with our newer technology, it has gotten easier. But even with all the new technology, you still have to do the work to make sure that you're not inferring causation when all you really have is correlation. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, and you think you'll be interested in more videos about public health, click like and subscribe. Thank you. I hope to see you soon.